Oh, hey folks, welcome to this one, and this is a video about why space combat is wrong. Yes, wrong. Most sci-fi shows have gotten this horribly, horribly wrong. How can you say that? I hear you all cry. Well, no, I realise there is no real space combat to base this on. But let's talk physics, shall we? Physics are a wonderful thing. Physics lets us understand how things would work and how things operate. Elite Dangerous is a great tool for me to show you some of these. Now, the first part of this is Newton's third law. Every object has an e every force has an equal and opposite reaction. So, for example, spaceship. I drive forwards. I throttle to zero. I stop. That's not very realistic, is it? Now. Flight assist off. I throttle up. I throttle to zero. Look at this. I keep... Well, I'm in negative thrust there, so I keep going. In fact, I could even turn around. Let's look back at the station. Oh, look, there it is. We're flying away. Why are we flying away? There's no resistance. Space isn't like flying in the atmosphere where friction will slow you down. I need to apply opposite thrust to reduce my velocity to zero. That's the first part most sci-fi shows get wrong. You see ships flying around very much like aircraft and this means suddenly you don't have the key ingredient to space. Movement. See I can now fly sideways past this station and if I apply thrust in the opposite direction I can stop and I can turn around. Another consideration is most vessels are built like ships. Earth ships. Most fighters look like aircraft. Now, in some purposes, there is a necessity to that. Because, in, for example, Star Wars, you will see X-Wings and TIE fighters flying in the, in the atmosphere of planets. Now, seeing as I've still got flight to stop here, I need to be a little bit more paying attention to things. But... They do need some sort of wing surfaces to fly. Let's put assist on just for a second so I can stop in a realistic manner. Now, here we go. This is the Imperial Eagle in Elite Dangerous. Yes, it has wings. But those wings, as you can see, are partially for weapon storage. Keeps the weapons away from the main body of the craft, which reduces heat. Which is why the X-Wing has its weapons on the tips of its wings reduce heat those wings that pop open are actually radiators to radiate heat the s foil now of course a lot of these things are licensed for creativity and do excuse me license for creativity and this allows the sci-fi ships to look really cool do we really need all these things if a ship is dedicated to flying in space no you could chop the wings off you could just make it a single tube it would work just as well as long as you have maneuvering jets because unlike in the atmosphere we aren't using our wings and control surfaces to move you'll notice on the wing here on top you'll notice there on the fuselage if i can go underneath you'll see the same little circles those are thrusters maneuvering thrusters they allow you to enact a force in given directions which changes your angle now, you must apply an opposite force to correct that as we go back into the ship. For example, with flight assist on, I can go up and down and it stops me. Flight assist off. I thrust up. I keep drifting because until I apply thrust down, I'm there's nothing to resist the movement of the ship. Okay? So it means that the ship will continue moving. Now, another consideration for sci-fi is... Let's have a look at this landing pad. Oh, wait. There's one there. There's one here. And there's even one there. Why? Well, there's no down in space. There is no up, there is no down, there is no left, there is no right. And 
That brings another facet to space combat. You always see them fighting on the same angle. When two star uh, starships meet in Star Trek, it's funny how they're all orientated the same way, isn't it? Both equally upright, rather than one being twisted around 90 degrees or 45 degrees to the other ship. Because it doesn't matter. Direction is irrelevant. Now, I'm not talking about the zero-d anti-gravity or, shall we say, artificial gravity used on some sci-fi spaceships. We'll ignore that. That's not relevant. And Star Trek and Star Wars both take that for granted. They have artificial gravity generators, which could be plausible but at some point in the future. We just don't know how that's going to work. But what I will talk about is several shows that got it right in varying ways or others. First, we're going to go to somewhere else. We've looked at this station for long enough. We're going to magically now disappear and reappear in an asteroid belt. Boop. Like magic, we are here. In the asteroid belts are around... I believe this is Yamusu 5. Well, this gives us another example. Now, we're not going to do any combat here per se, but... I want to show you some things. First off, the zero reference point I made. Irrelevant in space, because... There's no up and down. Now, I'm at the bottom of the belt, the top of the belt. Who knows? Where is the galaxy orientated? And that's one thing you see in space dogfights. You see people flying around like this, fighting. Let's pull the weapons out. Flying around. Oh, look, following them, turning fight. And suddenly, pew, pew, pew. Doesn't work that way. If I'm being followed by someone in a space dogfight in reality, or shall we say, accordance with the laws of physics, I can do this. Oh look, they're now in front of me. What science fiction show does that remind you of? Battlestar Galactica. Surprisingly accurate with its space combat. You'll see the Vipers flitting around, pulling U-turns, flipping on their back, flying sideways. It's actually surprisingly accurate. And the same thing would apply to The Expanse. Netflix original, of course. Incredible show. And very accurate. In fact, that's two other points. Both those shows use projectile weapons. Why? Well... Laser weapons tend to draw away from the more realistic side both those shows want to portray. And also, projectile weapons are great in space. You know we talked about acceleration. As my headphones bleep, which is nice of them. We talk about acceleration. Well, one of those things you don't have to deal with in terms of acceleration is that projectiles don't have trajectories or arcs. There's no gravity acting on them, or minimal, depending on where you are next to a planet or a gravitational body. And... For example, if I fire these multi-cannon rounds, that rock is four, five, six kilometers away. They're going to hit basically where my crosshair is located at the same velocity they left the barrel. Because nothing's to stop them. This is why things like that, a railgun, which we have now, they exist. Oh, I need more charge in my weapon systems. A railgun. Electronically accelerated projectiles, no gunpowder. They exist already. We have them. The US Navy is fitting them to ships. This technology exists and it's not implausible. Both Battlestar Galactica and the Expanse use railguns, miniguns, actual kinetic weapons because kinetic weapons will work. And thermal weapons, aka lasers, whilst they exist, don't work quite as well. They can be affected by things like solar radiation. They can be affected by energy shields or absorbent materials. Kinetic rounds cannot. So you have essentially potentially infinite acceleration on a projectile. You could suddenly have serious damage caused to a spaceship. Here's an interesting point for you. I'm going to throttle to zero here. And we're going to turn off flight assist. And I'm going to see if Elite Dangerous will simulate something for me. No, it does not. That's kind of annoying. I may need to impart more force than it's willing to give me, but... 
Another consideration for reality is if I was firing these projectiles, that's imparting a force. Minimal, but a force. My ship would move backwards. So firing your guns forwards would, in fact, slow your ship down. Which is why something like the Expanse, where you see the gunship, the Rosinante, has miniguns all over it apart from forwards. This means it can fire those guns, yet maintain its velocity in space. They aren't firing on the axis of movement. So that's a consideration. Would that mean in realistic space battles we see wingless ships flying around, firing turreted weapons? Yes, that's entirely plausible. And once you kind of appreciate the differences, it makes things interesting. Of course, I've seen several videos debunking space combat and they talk about removing the wings from, for example, a TIE fighter. Now, a TIE fighter's wings are not wings, per se. In fact, in Star Wars lore, these ships don't have wings. Even the X-wing... They're not wings. As I mentioned, they're cooling veins. They allow the weapon systems to cool off. The S-foil design allows it to dissipate more heat. Which is when it's firing its weapons. It's generating a lot of heat. And heat has to go somewhere in space. And these wings are not wings. They have repulsor lit jets for when they're flying in atmospheres that lift some, basically, anti-gravity. Now, you talk about taking the wings off in a, a TIE fighter. It doesn't need them. A TIE fighter does. TIE means twin ion engine. Those wings you see on a TIE fighter are actually solar collectors, like a satellite, because we have ion engines now. They exist. Satellites on Earth have ion engines. They're very minimal, and they're about as much power as breathing on something, but it's a force that's imparted. Now, part of that is a gas mixing with a charge. And for the charge, you need electricity. And the TIE Fighter's wings are actually solar collection panels, which allow it to collect electricity to create ions to push in a given direction. That ex that's real technology. That exists. Satellites use that now around this planet. There are ion-engined uh, space vehicles flying around. It's very, very, very efficient. Of course, the power of a TIE Fighter, not quite the same. So don't expect satellites are flying around screeching the of TIE fighters. Also, that's the weirdest sound I've ever made. But the point stands. Space combat can happen in any direction. Can happen most likely with kinetic weapons. And considering the technology we have now, it's more than plausible it could happen. Two armed space vessels could duke it out over the skies of... over the round the atmosphere of Earth. Even today. It would be very janky, very messy, and very complicated, but it's plausible. So shows like The Expanse, like Battlestar Galactica, are some of the most realistic representations of space combat. There is no up. There is no force to stop you. The normal rules of flight as a human mind views them in terms of dogfighting doesn't exist. Both those shows demonstrate that. The ability to have to have spacecraft that are oriented in certain directions doesn't matter. The expanse. Look at the way the floors are oriented in their ships. The floors are orientated with the engines. So if we look outside the eagle here, I'm orientated like you'd expect in a fighter plane. Sitting in the front. Now, the expanse deals with gravity in spacecraft by orientating them like this. The pilot would be sitting facing where my back is now. What does that do? It means the thrust direction of the ship, where the engines are firing, pushes the ship against your feet. It's a form of gravity, or at least a simulated gravity, and suddenly you end up with space combat turning on its head. Is Star Wars realistic? No. Is Star Trek realistic? No. Does that make them bad? Of course not. We love them. They're amazing. However, there is realistic sci-fi out there, and hopefully, now you've watched this, maybe you'll have a finer appreciation for how things can work and how things will work. And that's one of the reasons why I love Elite Dangerous as a video game, because not only can I fly with this assist feature on, which is how most people fly most of the time, you can also fly assist off. And in combat, you can mix the two. And I do mix the two very regularly. Thrusting in different directions, up and down, left and right whilst flying. Flight assist off to turn around. Multiple U-turns, normal boosted assisted flight, 
I mean, the flight assist is plausible. Computers could calculate the opposite forces to impart to simulate this effect. It's realistic. So is it realistic to say that all space flight would happen in this overcomplicated manner of having to manually control everything? No. So that's another one. Debunking the debunking is that, yeah, sure, we could have space flight that operates like more similar, I should say, to aerial flight. But of course, still without the down, still without the need to always fly like this. The limitations don't need to exist. So like I said, hopefully you've enjoyed this. Hopefully this has been an insightful video describing how space combat can work, could work, and might work, along with what doesn't work. So you've just been scienced by Fire Kitten. Thank you for watching, guys, and goodbye.